for all of you, please go and look at the ginkgo root. It's the most extraordinary root I've ever seen. It's fantastic. I would Ooh. love to have a dress look like that. Yeah, <laughs> no, I mean, unfortunately, I've never, I've never dug up a ginkgo, actually. I've done a lot yeah. of work with London Plain. Yeah. And um, a London Plain root always has this... I, I was able to identify that because of this sort of orange, yeah, corally, it's... slightly pink, slightly fr like your mum's mm. lipstick from the 1970s. Yes. You know, that sort of Max Factor, sort of bright orangey pink. Well, lipstick. hello. I really, really enjoyed this conversation with Kristin Moldestat. She is one of the co-authors of Roots, A Field Guide for Identification. This is a book I've been waiting for all my career. We had a proper nerdy conversation about Roots. What could be more interesting? Well, enjoy. So welcome to Kristen Moldestat. So glad to see you. Um, lovely to meet you all the way from Oslo in Norway. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much for uh, having me in this uh, podcast. It's a very, very interesting podcast. I've been listening to quite a lot of your work. So Kristen, tell us a little bit about yourself, please. Yeah, uh, I'm an um, arboriculturist or an arborist, as we call it here in Norway. I am 47 years old. Yes, I have two, three kids. Oh, <laughs> lovely. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, I think, I mean, I'm a bit older than you. I'm 56, but I think we look good. Folks, I, do think so. you, I think we look good <laughs> for our age. And folks, if you're listening and you're thinking, shall I work with trees? Well, it clearly is the best beauty treatment out there, isn't it? Being out there in the wind and the rain and the mud. <laughs> oh, definitely. I love to be outside. Yes. But I am a consultant, a consulting arborist. So, of course, there are a lot inside work as well. One day out, one week in, in more or less, because of yes. all the re report you have to write. Yeah, so I've been working in um, this industry since, yeah, since 2002. So yeah. it's been a while. Mm -hmm. So how did you come to work with trees? Um, I started uh, my degree as a horticulturist at the University of Agriculture in Norway. And uh, there I've come in, in touch with the Norwegian Society of Arboriculture. Uh, and I got a job at a tree care company more for dragging brush and yeah. supposed to climb a bit and I did climb a bit but uh, there were very a lot of English people in this company so oh. because we import English tree climber to Norway. Oh how strange. You, no it wasn't so strange because we don't didn't have so many people or so many arborists oh. in the industry at that time so it's quite, quite common and people come just for work for a couple of months or something like that or or longer period, shorter and longer period. But then they, were, they didn't speak so well Norwegian, so I end up always on the ground speaking to customers. Oh. So from uh, from that perspective, then I went more into the office and were more, more like working with customers and, and writing reports and uh, offers and stuff like that. And then I took um, the ISA, a certified arborist, and then I become a certified arborist. Oh, very good. Yes. And after five years in that company, I um, went over to another big engineer company where I work at the moment. But we are just two arborists. Wow. <laughs> so you have to have very loud voices to be heard amongst all the engineers, do you? You have to make your yes. case really clearly. Definitely. And uh, they do listen. They do. Yes, I'm sure. So, and if I think all the people at that this office knows about trees, and they know that trees have roots, so that's good. Yeah, that's really good. <laughs> that that is a start because it's still astonishing how people do forget that trees have roots and they can't put a cable or a road right next to the trunk. Yes, so, uh, it's well hidden. Done you. <laughs> yeah, it's hidden and you can see it. Yeah. And so we do work a lot with the people, the, the, what do you call the road engineers that build the roads or, or design the roads. 
and they are clearly very aware of that roots exist. I understand you also um, do some lecturing. Yes, I do. I do that in a very, very nice place in Norway. It's on the West Coast. It looks like a fairy tale, to be honest. Um, <laughs> no, you have the no nice mountains and the snow on the top. Yeah, but it's a technical school for um, people that have an education before or have been working in the industry for a while. So the youngest one, the youngest student is uh, 20 and the oldest are 60. So it's quite a big span of uh, age. And there are actually, this year, there are four women and there are 16 altogether. So that's very, very good. It's a very good um, group of students. Good. Yeah, I have a part-time part -time job there. So I teach in biology and um, plant ID, or three ID. <laughs> oh, that's great. And do you see that there's an increased interest in tree care and people wanting to be arborists in Norway? Is it something that young people or career changers are aware of? Are there enough people coming forward now, do you think? I think there are more and more be aware of that this industry exists. And uh, people, at least in the big city, they know what an arborist are. And they know that is something to do with trees, more or less. No, I'm speaking with the normal, all the rest. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and... Um, People are aware of that this is very important, uh, it's an important job. And because we have quite strict rules about how we um, b uh, dig around trees in the big cities, it's more, it's more and more, um, uh, you have to need, an, you need an arborist on a construction site, otherwise you're not allowed to do the work in some cities, not all, of course, not all. Oh, that's really interesting. So here in the UK, it's not, it's advisable that you have a, a, an arborist or an arboriculturalist on site when you're digging near trees. So here in the UK, if you're doing work near a tree um, and it's got planning permission to, say, build a house, there would need to be a tree report written by a suitably qualified person. Okay. And as part of that, um, the report would recommend that that would be supervised by that suitably qualified person, the arboriculturalist. Does it always happen? Hmm, not necessarily. Mm. And, you know, we hope that the planning permission conditions are really strong and say this must be supervised, but that doesn't always happen. So I'm no. interested to hear that in some cities in Norway... They, they literally can't work near any tree. Yeah, but so, of course, it's not always this happened, but yes, that's, that's our goal. And we see an increase in this actually happens. I'm just going slightly off topic, really, because I'm just um, interested in how things are in Norway. Do you have certain trees which are protected? Yes, we do. Uh, we have um, all oaks that are over 200 centimeter in circumference at 1.3 uh, chest height. Yes. And are not in a planted forest or in forestry, uh -huh. are preserved by law. You're not allowed to fell them because we lack old oak trees. Uh -huh. And we lack all old trees because we have had this industry of exporting timber to other parts of the world and using them for for ship as well. So we actually, so this law came in 2009 and um, it's actually, this law is actually made to make you no know, house, housing areas for the insects and all the, all the organisms that lives in these oak trees. So that's why it has yeah. come. Oh, that's and, good. And has there been any public opposition to this? Are people fed up about not being able to fell an oak tree in their garden, for example? There are not so many old oak trees in the garden, but there are some. And of course, yes, people are a bit on, oh, why can't I build yeah. in, in my own garden? It's my property. I should be allowed to do what I want to do. But I also think that there are um, a bigger understanding I think for all of our, all the humans, that nature are more important than we actually have treated it as before. 
So I think I think as uh, at least new people and younger people appreciate the nature probably more than the old people. Well, so, not all old people, of course. Yes, but yeah. So so there is a, a general cultural understanding in Norway that trees are good, old oaks are good, and we need to take care of them because it benefits nature. Yeah, sort of, but um, still people see us. I mean, we, we do have so many trees here in Norway, so why why is this one important? I mean, hello, we do have like hundreds and hundreds of miles of forest, so I have to take care of this one single oak. Why can't I get, just cut it down? And we do, but we do also have regulations uh, in uh, specific for every city in certain areas of Oslo you're not allowed to fell trees that are over one meter in circumstances and even some places there are ni 90 centimeters in circumferences then you have to apply to the to the municipal to to get it felled and so um, the council can either say yes or or can they say no? Um, they can say no. Yeah. Yes. If you if you want to, for instance, if you want to take down an oak tree and you apply, you probably will get a no. Yes. If you don't okay. have very very good reasons for felling it. And can the householder or the applicant appeal against that decision? Yes, but I'm not quite sure if that will um, end up in a yes anyway. Yeah, interesting. No, I just, I just, it's actually not dissimilar to some of the regulations in the UK where we have conservation areas where it's a similar sort of legislation in mm. the sort of areas of greater historical landscape importance in cities that everything's yeah. protected over a certain size. Yeah, but so if you're going to have a yes, you have to do a big report telling that if I fell this oak tree it won't hurt the whole oak population in Norway and you have to like look at the big oh. picture the small picture and and write this down so it it's a bit of a job yes that sounds really really fascinating well thank you for that sorry to digress but it's always <laughs> so wonderful to hear from different countries on tree regulation and and what the abura culturalist or arborist scene is like there so it sounds like it's, it's doing really well in norway and we are working on it to be get it more and better and better every every yeah. year <laughs> yeah and talking of which you're also involved with fagus tell us about fagus what does that do yeah fagus is a big is not a big it's an uh, umbrella organization for all smaller organizations that are into the green industry for instance like the tree the national tree care organization is one of those organizations and they have like built an umbrella over it so that we could try to cooperate a bit more and not just sit on every little house around and we we have a, a board there as well that discuss things uh, across of every other other on the other organization um that's really good to have that collaboration and to learn from each other isn't it so it is yeah, yeah. oh very good mm. well the reason why i've asked you to speak today is because of this book roots a field guide for identification which is available from the abura cultural association in the uk and this is a book that we have been waiting for all of our professional lives <laughs> Tell us about what inspired you to start working on this book with your colleague. Of course, you worked with Olva. Yeah, Olva Lundetre, yeah. Uh, it's the thing that inspired us to make this book was actually an oak tree. We got an um, uh, uh, uh an architect company asked us to to look at this area because they were going to build around it and they want to save the oak tree and they asked us how can we do this all that uh, and this oak tree was in the, in the kindergarten with lots of other trees around so um we had a look and yes it's a nice oak tree and luckily it was over 200 centimeter in circumference so they also in had to to um, preserve this oak tree and it was good looking as well so it was nice to have so the architect were very positive to to do this as well um, and um, that we they started digging and th this 
this is is a bit funny i think because this was the year that when i and my family we were actually living in france one year so i got this job and i couldn't be on site so then i asked uh, olva and his company to go out and um, have a look at the tree and i can be on facetime high tech you know <laughs> yeah yeah oh, i've done that too <laughs> yeah and then uh, they started digging because they had to do some test digging uh, and there was such a mangle of roots different roots and we could see that the roots are very different but we could not at that point tell which root belongs to the oak tree and which roots belong to the hazel the maple the birch the laburnum and all the other bushes around so then we started search on the internet and we did find some papers and there are of course uh, some very very good books about roots but not the kind you can take out in your pocket and go out and see okay this is the oak and this is the birch so then we just started to study the roots and to be, this one we want to look more into it and um, after a while we got quite a good sample of roots and then other, other alpers asked can we have can you share this yeah yeah okay we can we, may, we have to make a booklet then so that was the inspiration to do yeah. it. And as this project just grew and went on, we needed more roots. And luckily, or maybe I can say unluckily, we had good access to roots because there are a lot of digging projects around in Oslo. So uh, we got um, access to trenches where roots were available. And they were close to trees. There were no like misunderstanding which root it came from. So then we took samples of this. Uh, and if we were lucky and the weather was good, we could take photos outside on the site and describe it because it's always best to look at it when they are fresh. Absolutely. Yeah, because they ch yeah. can change quite quickly, can't they? Yeah, yeah they, they change. And that's a very good characteristic because some roots like them are... Um, yeah, Ulmus glabra, for instance, mm -hmm. change color when you cut it. But um, castanea, hippocastanum, do not change color. So that's a characteristic so you yeah. can use. So we got to, to study this. And uh, suddenly we had like 37 roots. And then we thought, oh, then we, this is good. We have to just go forward and make this book. So we, we got fundings from... Um, uh, Nordisk Fond for Bytrer, uh, the Nordic Foundation for City Trees, yeah. um, to uh, actually make the booklet. Or, or yeah, we got so, so we could start the, that process. Mm -hmm. And then we made the, this uh, Norwegian book. We sent an abstract to the ISA uh, annual conference in Malmö and got a conference there. And then it just, yeah, I had to speak, speak there about the project and then it just rolled on and rolled on. So now it's in English as well, thanks to the Arbury Culture Association. Well, we love it. So the book itself um, has, is it 47 different species? Yeah, I think the English one has something like that, yeah. Yes. Because um, we added seven more in the English species, in, yeah. in, in English book, yeah. <laughs> And so um, the book, um, for those who are listening and haven't yet got a copy, I urge you to get it. Um, it's quite a small book. You know, it's it's about A5. It's got a plastic cover. So it's super handy to take out in the field. The pages are kind of shiny. It's really logically set out. And it's got some absolutely brilliant photographs for each route. It's got a, a long view um, we have a tape measure next to it. It's got a cross section and it's got a really good description. So I, I love it. But tell us about um, the different characteristics of a root, like what you looked for in order to describe it. Yes, uh, we sort of made up the road as we were going through this project because it's a, it's a very practical approach to a project we just got into it and did it and then we used our spare time to, <laughs> spare to finish time. it yeah <laughs> sorry <laughs> yeah. it's the spare time project <laughs> yeah 
Yeah. Now, so we started to see, first of all, we saw that the bark, or it's actually more correct to say periderum, yes. is um, very different on the roots. And we, why is that? We don't know why. We don't know any whys. But uh, yeah. we saw that the bark pore or the lentil cells have different growth directions. In some roots, they are the same way as the growth length. And in some roots, they are opposite. How interesting. I've yeah. never actually looked for that. I've always but, gone by color um, yeah. and feel, but do carry on. Yeah. yeah the color of the periderm. Or the, I would like to say bark because that's actually the term we use. Let's say bark, knowing that it's not the correct technical word, but it's yes. actually very understandable. It's so very let's carry on. Yeah. Okay. So forgive us, purists. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So for instance, like the populus alba is quite black or grey or, or very grey, dark grey on the bark. And other, other species like the ginkgo, for instance, has a very fabric bark so you, uh, you have the color that's different and you have the texture as well some bark are smooth and some are very more like um, a textile or fabric or something fascinating it's it's very different if you if you have a for all of you please go and look at the ginkgo root it's the most extraordinary root i ever seen it's fantastic i would Ooh. love to have a dress look like that yeah <laughs> no i mean unfortunately i've never I've never dug up a ginkgo actually i've done a lot no. of work with london plain yeah and um a london plain root always has this i, I was able to identify that because of this sort of orange yeah corally it's... slightly pink slightly fr like your mum's mm. lipstick from the 1970s yes you know that sort of max factor sort of bright orangey pink lipstick and that was really handy for me to find yeah and i i really think this is really helpful because like you i work with tree roots mm. often in city locations and Understanding the colour and the textural change and the pliability, you know, how some are very stiff, some are very yeah. bendy, aren't they? Yes, and that you have to see at on site because some yes. because the roots often get very stiff after a while. So yes. if you're if you get like a, in the post and then check what it is, you can't use the stiffness anymore because then it's probably yes, too stiff. Too dry. So the the bark is very, very different from every root actually. Yeah, and, and you have like some have more like the camouflage, like the or Aesculus, Hippocustanum, and, and also the London plain is a bit, bit sort of camouflage. It is, yes, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. And uh, then you have the, the prunus, uh, the prunus avium, we have, which is actually very black and have this strange pattern that looks like it's old and uh, very crunchy. Yeah. Uh, uh, to look at, but it's not actually. <laughs> yeah. And then you have the yellow roots. There are lots of yellow roots. And um, the mo the fun, the nicest one in color is probably the Morus nigra, who is bright orange, bright yellow, yes. and have lines that, that's bark pearl, that are purple. Yes, I've seen them because I was involved with a project in North London with a very precious, much loved mulberry tree. Yeah. Which mm. um, this mulberry tree, we tried to keep it on a development site, but in the end, it just couldn't happen because no. of piling and cables. And and so the local residents were terribly upset and, you know, one could understand why. And they dressed the tree and they held a vigil around the tree and... There were 6,000 people who wrote in and said, we've got to keep this tree, it's really special, even though it had Ganoderma, by the way, and it, but oh. nevertheless. So, yeah. um, so my very wonderful client, a local authority client, um, said, right, we're going to move it. And so we worked with a specialist company in the UK called Ruskins. Yeah. And um, they very carefully air spaded around this tree and very carefully lifted this Morris Nigra and I could see that I was there and I could see the roots and all their technicolor, technicolor glory absolutely stunning yeah. but there mm. is a problem with this it does have a happy ending 
but despite all the checks that they made for underground services and all the permissions and everything needed, there was a mystery electric cable that went through the <laughs> centre of the roots, root plate, oh, yeah. about half a metre down, and it was a total nightmare. So this tree was carefully lifted and it was sort of on the crane, hoist, and there was this cable, and it was a real problem. And there was no nobody would say, we put it back in the ground, thinking we've got to find out, is this cable, can it be cut? Nobody yeah. knew about the cable, and it was yeah. in central London. So in the end, they had to very carefully root prune around this cable and plant the tree. And I can happily tell everybody that a year and a half on, thanks to the great care of this company and the aftercare with um, root drenching and, and mulching, etc., it's thriving. But I just want to tell you that little story of, of my yeah. sort of experience with the Morris Niger roots and... Um, yeah, it's absolutely fascinating. But but the difference in the roots is as fascinating as the difference in the bark of the trunk and the branch yeah. of the tree, would you say? Yes, definitely. It's it's no uh, no difference between above and below ground. It's uh, as different and as unique as the leaves for the different species, yeah. Species are. So one of the things, though, that is going through my mind, so... I understand that you did, so, so this isn't an academic study, this is a practitioner guide. Yeah. So you, you are a, a lady in the field doing the work and this is what mm. you found. Yeah. So I understand, did you do like a couple of the same species or in terms yes. of sample windows? Yes, we did some uh, because we were very lucky to have a um, landscape laboratory laboratory they have 100 different species at the norwegian agriculture university and they have planted two or three or maybe four in a row and they have to thin that out so and they the thinned that out the year before we started so the root was still fresh so we get the chance to go there and then they had the label on the stub so we could go and dig close to the, the stub where they have felled the tree already so then we could check if it's correct or not. So we have done that with all the all, all the one we they had, um, and um, we also have had some cross checking with in other places around Oslo as well. So we have had, but more like two or three samples from each root or from each species. So it's not more than that. So with the two or three different samples of the same species. Were they always the same characteristics? I mean, obviously, the morphology would be different because of the site conditions, but in terms of colour, yeah. pliability, odour... Yes, the bark is similar. And, yeah, I haven't mentioned the cross-section yet. but Yeah, tell us about yeah, that. They are also very similar. You can see some variation in, like, for the, the Quercus rubber. Uh, it's uh, maybe some would have a bit more more uh, medullar and race than the other ones but the main thing is that it's very similar so it's good to know that you were finding the same sort of results with each species so that gives you comfort now i just wonder um do you think any of it is a response to the environment that it's in so i wonder if that a city london plane looks like such and such and a London plain in a completely different climate and a different soil, I wonder if it's the same. I suspect it is the same because my description of London plain root is the same as yours yeah. and my description of Morris Nigra is the same as yours. What are your thoughts on that? I think they are very much the same. There could be some difference in how they grow because of um, stones and other um, soil yes. conditions. But the one we have seen, we as a birch is very common in um, the field and in the forest here. And it's also quite common to use as a street tree. And they are look the same. Yeah. And the maple we have seen look the same. And... Um, yeah, the um, aspen look the same. I found they look mm. the same. So um, in terms of my root exploration career, mm. you know, with air spading over sort of 10 to 15 years, 
yeah. I would see the same thing. I've just sort of thought I'd discuss that in case of there were any differences. Yeah. I will see differences in um, the morphology of the roots because roots are opportunistic. They're going to grow where they get what they need. Yeah. So they can be deeper, they can be shallower, they can be a few really thick roots or a lot of very um, finer roots depending on how they can get the stuff they need yeah and i also sorry no and there's also we have studied roots that are like one centimeters in diameters and we see the same characteristic in bigger root and also in a bit smaller root but when it comes to finer root we haven't studied them that much no yeah we have seen that they are also very unique from each species as well. So there, I think we have another project coming up studying more fine roots. That would be very good. Oh, we love yeah. that. <laughs> we love that. And also the visible mycorrhizae as well, you would have yeah. seen mm. all the time, which is fascinating. And um, quite often in very sort of stony soils, I see this big fat cushioning. Mm where the root is growing, particularly with pinus, yes. growing around rocks. I did some work in Montpellier and uh, we excavated there and it was it was almost like a row of beads and it was literally a pinus root growing over rocks oh, one yeah. after the other so that they're incredible in how they adapt. Mm. They just grow where they can, actually. Yeah, yeah. they do, they do. So I, I think this work is really important because... You, you mentioned a case right at the beginning of what inspired the book of you had a particular project and there were different species and you needed to keep the oak. Mm. I've had very similar um, projects and um, my thoughts are there are pros and cons of different types of root exploration. Sometimes digging a hole is okay. Mm -hmm. Other times air spading, other times tree radar where you don't want to disturb, disturb the ground at all. Yeah. But the trouble is with radar is that it won't tell you which root is from which tree. No, it won't. No. <laughs> Only the excavation will do that. And then you need to understand yeah. what they look like. And another thing I find with, with this book or to have a book about this thing is that you can refer to the book and then you have more uh, uh, people on this construction site will believe you a bit more. Although, yeah, it's a book I've written myself, but still, it's it's on the paper. It says here that this is this is actually the, um, the maple tree we want to save or the oak tree. And it's, it's not the bush so you have the shrub, so you have to be careful about it. Uh, and it gives you a bit more a, a reference you can use. I think you've just come back from a really good conference. It's the nerdiest conference I ever been to, I think. It's the landscape yeah. below ground and it's just about the landscape below ground. Wow. So it's a two day conference. Ahead of that, there were one day with workshops and uh, afterwards all the speakers were collected in one room and decided to discuss what to study next. So it was a very, very good conference. So I'm really grateful to could participate in that one and uh, to the Arboretum who has organized this together with ISA but it's organized just every five, fifth year I think I'm going to try and go to the next one yeah you have to I saw that you were going and I thought oh crumbs it was bad timing for me yeah. I couldn't possibly go but, but the next um... one is in five years so just to save oh, <laughs> yeah yeah that's great that's great <laughs> because I think it's all about what's happening underground now I think that people are waking up, um, the general public, there's a consciousness about the wood wide web and the fact that there is communication between trees through mycorrhizae, et cetera, et cetera. I think people are, are switching on to this and there has been real gaps in our knowledge and there always will be. But to hear that you've been to a conference, I mean, what, what other ideas were they at the conference that we could, you think, might be explored without giving too much away generally in the community yeah so luckily all the um, all the speakers have to write their um, little um, they're going to be a booklet a, a book from the conference with all them um, yeah with, with articles for for speakers but there were a lot of interesting um uh, about struct uh, structural roots and how the structural root grows and they have um, some of the researchers had also uh, 
cut the, the uh, dug up the whole root system, take it up, take it apart, measured it, and then I put it together again. And then I took a 3D scanning of it. And then they uh, um, made the 3D scanner into a 3D model. So they could print it in a smaller version. So you can like, have a structure of the root. Fantastic. Oh, I really like that because that's so good for education, not yeah. just for us arborists, mm. but for for anybody learning. Um, be good to take on a construction site, wouldn't it? And say, yes. look, this is why you can't put your great big skip and run your <laughs> dumper underneath the tree because yeah. this is what a tree looks like. Definitely. Roughly as an average. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm. Gosh, what a great idea. Yeah, and then there was also um, Stephanie Adams who had a workshop about how to see difference between healthy and deceased roots. Yeah. The finer roots, and that's very important. Yeah, and absolutely. it's difficult if you don't know how the finer root look like. And Tell us about that. So, so for those listening, how would you tell the difference between a healthy root and a diseased root? Yeah, first of all, you need to know how the the not diseased root look like on that species. It could be whitish or it could be grayish, it could be a thick root, it could be a very fine root. So you have to actually dig up some roots that you think are are healthy and then compare it to the ones that you think are deceased. And then you see the difference. That's great, but um, unless you have a book like yours or you have the knowledge, because I think that actually getting to have a look underground isn't always that easy. No, it's in not. Our day-to-day work. But you, you you have to use all your senses. You have to smell. And if you smell something strange, it's probably not good because soil, healthy soil, normally smells good. Or yeah, you, we know what healthy soils smell like. And if it doesn't smell good, it's probably something. If, it, if it's very wet, the, the, the root can't live. So, so then you can see on the root in very wet condition, they probably are uh, not as fresh and not as um, vigor. Uh, they maybe have a discolor or or they could like be tear apart with no effort. And that's signs of they being sick. It's been fascinating to hear about the work that you've done, but where did it all start? What was the first root that you discovered? You, the first root after the, the oak that we were uh, that inspired us was actually um, Juglans, Juglans Nigra, because uh, uh, we were they had this trench where they were open and we could have a look. And when it took off the cover of the the, the, the trench was covered with some plastic uh, sheets, and we took it off, and it was very interesting because it was yellow, yellowish, greenish, yellowish. And there was what is it that? Is that the way it's going to be? look? And yes, it is. Definitely, it is. That's the way it is, is going to see. And then we took a, took some samples. And if you see in the booklet, you see that's the first and maybe the worst pitch because that was actually the first pitch we <laughs> you took, you know, I took <laughs> before I, I brought a better camera. So it's in there and it's yellow inside. And then we compare it to um, the Juglans Cinera, which is a black walnut afterwards and, and that has a totally different uh, bark it's not so uh, bright or, or it doesn't have this yellow tune it's more black and bla- also have more blackish uh, lenticels but the the black one also have this very um, uh, fine color change and it was actually quite funny because i had a piece of it and it's it's um when you take it off it's sort of brownish uh, brownish and then it turns yellow after quite uh, a short while and I had it in my pocket and I was going to show it to someone I forgot so I had it in a pocket for one day and I took it up and it was turned totally black <laughs> oh what has happened here but of course that's just oxidation so it's quite normal and then you take it off it's, it's yellow underneath again and we had another good experience with uh, Ulmus, uh, uh, Ulmus glabra it's not so many Ulmus glabra left in the world because of the Dutch Alm disease mm. but it's a very very interesting root. First of all, if you cut it, it's uh, it's bright. The flesh, you could say, is bright yeah. white. It's more like a inside of a coconut when it's oh. open. And then after a short while, it turns yellowish. And if the roots are exposed to air over time, uh, 
it starts to uh, leak out some slimy stuff like a secrete. And this secrete I found in other um, uh, trenches where these roots have been exposed. And I wonder, what is this? And I don't know what it is, but in the old days when they were a bit more poor and didn't have so much food, they actually used almost glabra for making bread. They used this kind of slime in the, in the bread loaf. It's very, very wow. full of nutrients. And actually in in the bad years, they were, you were not allowed to cut down an elm tree if not you were going to eat it. Wow, that... I never knew that. <laughs> Isn't it very cool? <laughs> that is so cool. Trees, everybody who listens to this podcast <laughs> know, trees are just endlessly wonderful. Yes. And they're here to help us. Mm. Wow. Yeah, and the first pink root we, we, we found was the Salix caprea. That was in the forest when we, we got that one, and it covered with the soil, and this, and then we just cracked it a bit, and just, oh, it's pink. Have you yeah. seen this? So, me and all of them just <laughs> went, wow, it's so exciting. Yeah. <laughs> it is. I love the enthusiasm because it is exciting. Yeah. But I wonder, when you went home, you say you've got three children. Or I've got two children who are... My, uh, grown adults now yeah mm. and um I used to go around when they were at, at primary school and, and uh at secondary school and get really excited if I drove past a tree with them in the back on the way to school with their friends I used to take to school and suddenly pull over and see like a really interesting fungus <laughs> on a tree yeah it's like oh mom <laughs> <laughs> do, what do your children think about your root collection? Mom, not another root in the house. Oh, yeah, the actress thinks it's quite cool, I think. Oh, but, that's good. But the, the oldest one, they're twins, they're 20 now, so they think it's very cool. And yeah. Yeah, so they're just like, wow, go for it. Roots are the best. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then the one I just love, and he's just like, oh, oh, okay, whatever you do. But, yeah. But they do know the names of the trees from here and to school that's very very <laughs> good actually because you know um, i think that um as i think that science is evolving and we are becoming more aware of everything underground and everything on a microscopic level as well mm. so so this is really important to help us identify what is what for practical reasons in the field when we want to save one tree and, and remove another and do something technical near it. But yeah. also, for tree health point of view, as you quite rightly say, how can we save a tree root is disease if we don't know what it looks like in the first place when it's healthy? Yes, and one more thing we have, we have found, I'm, I'm not quite sure what the answer is, but we have seen that these roots that we have cut that are, are like one centimeter or so in in diameter. They're quite old. If you if you count the yearings, I also learned that yearings underground are not so um, um, uh, accurate. You say that accurate? Yes, they're not necessarily indicative of the age. No, yes. not necessary. But we had one root uh, which were one centimeter in diameter had nine rings. Mm -hmm. So it could be nine years. Or it could be older or it could be less. But anyway, it's more than one year, definitely. So I think we have to look at the roots that are, we think they are small because if you compare a one centimeter diameter branch to one centimeter root, you think the branch may be one year, maybe just half a year. But the root could be much, much older because it's it's living in this very tight area because branches have air around, roots have soil. It's quite hard to develop um gain weight when you are like in a tiny little square wow that's really fascinating so i think certainly here in the uk we have a rule that not a rule a guide yeah that a root as thick as your thumb um i often go in a building site and say anything as thick as your thumb or bigger is really important yeah anything smaller well, if you need to, we can prune that away. Obviously, it has a use. It's not a, it's not, anyway, it's less sensitive. But what you're saying is makes perfect sense because there's a sheer difficulty of growing a root through the soil medium. It takes longer. 
So they're much older. They're, they've, they've got a much greater uh, importance to the tree than we've assumed. We've assumed they're yeah. perhaps fairly young and ephemeral. and. Because if you have to cut down a nine-year-old branch, you may not think that's a good idea. Yeah. So, And we do not know too much about how root grow over rot. We don't know exactly how they respond in the ground. I, there hasn't been too much research on that. Probably some, probably, definitely. But it's, I think it's very interesting. And we did find some root that had been cut some years ago. We don't know when. And they had like tried to uh, conceal around the, the but, cutting. There's but, a photograph of that in your book, isn't there? Yeah, there is. Yes, which is very interesting. So, yeah, so... The, if anyone could study that a bit, it would be very great. <laughs> be very good because, of course, you've got all the stored carbohydrates yeah. in the roots mm. and all of that energy the tree is invested in growing that root mm. through the soil to support the tree and do all the biological functions that the tree needs. Um, it obviously takes a really long time. So, And I also, you know, like you, I've read that there isn't necessarily a correlation between root rings and tree age but then I wonder really how much research has been done are you doing the research that might change that conventional thinking I've seen some paper on it and there was that thing it was from Austria so there are there are people looking into this so it would be interesting to study that a bit more the roots are very funny and fascinating it's a fascinating world underneath the ground yes <laughs> absolutely so this book roots is clear and easy to understand and you set out what you see in a number of different trees of the same species but have you had any feedback from any arborists to say well the roots where i am are completely different you know london plain is is more of a, a dark brown or something like that have you had any feedback which questions your work not yet and i very I, I really want to have this feedback because this is not a scientific work and it's the work we have done mostly in norway and actually some roots from new jersey as well so i will i have asked for people to give me this feedback the only feedback we have got is that it is suitable for what i see it does match with the root people dig up and also that the booklet is not so good with coffee ah, <laughs> yeah. so if people want to get in touch with you how should they do that i think linkedin is a good way yeah that works mm. and uh, uh, the book is available in norwegian of course in the norwegian um, different uh, shops and it's available under arborist as arboriculture associations in the UK, and it will be in a couple of weeks from now at the ISA in the US. Excellent, excellent. So in terms of the Arboricultural Association in the UK, yeah. it's trees.org.uk, and there's a section there where you can buy publications. So it's it's there. Yeah, and I have to also say a big, huge thank you to... Um, to the Arboriculture Association for actually printing the book and producing the book in, in England because they did all the costs for that. So that's very grateful oh, for. Great. No, oh, good on them. That's marvellous. Finally, um, Christine, I always ask my guests, what is your dream scenario? What do you wish for, for trees? Oh, I wish that people should beware of the whole tree the whole tree from the roots and not just the root but also the condition they live in because the root doesn't stop with the root zone doesn't stop with the root it stops actually where the water comes into the root and the nutrients came in so i i want people to be aware of that it's a whole organism from the top the top of the leaf around the crown the stem and the roots and there are very important organs to the tree the whole unit of them the whole thing it's not just a tree above the ground there is much more to it excellent thank you so much Kristin Moldestad it's been an absolute pleasure to be nerdy 
about one of my favourite subjects, tree roots. Very well done for all that you've carried out um, with your colleague. And I urge listeners to buy a book of roots, a field guide for identification and feedback to you on LinkedIn if they don't agree or if they do. So thank you. Thank you very much.